Hey everybody, welcome back. This uh, segment of the webinar is gonna be about neutron stars, black holes. So what are they? Um, let's start with neutron stars. Neutron stars are super dense stellar um, corpses. So they're, it's a dense object that's formed when a really massive star dies. Um, so it's the core of that massive star that's been compressed down is about one um, solar mass, one uh, one of our sun's worth of material compressed down to the size of, say, like New York City. And it's called a neutron star because at that point, it's so dense and the gravitational field is so strong that the atoms inside can't, um, can't maintain their structure and the electrons and protons fuse together to form neutrons. And so you get this New York-sized ball of neutrons. And so that's about one to two solar masses. But if you get much bigger than say three solar masses, then even the neutrons can't withstand the gravitational force and it just keeps collapsing down to basically a single point of enormous mass. And that's a black hole. Um, so the gravitational field around that um, point of uh, mass is so strong that any light that falls onto it is not able to escape. Um, and that's why we call it a black hole, because there's no light that can reflect off of it. Um, so black holes are obviously invisible for exactly the reason I just described. Neutron stars are effectively invisible because they're so small that any light they emit is not going to be picked up by um, our telescopes, at least not with the technology that we currently have. Um, so how do we learn anything about these objects if we can't see them? Well, we have to be a little bit clever and we basically take advantage of some gravitational effects. Um, and that's what this webinar is going to be about. So the first one is, um, it's called accretion and specifically uh, the accretion disk, which is basically when you have a neutron star or a black hole um, and there's matter that's falling onto it, it doesn't just directly fall onto it. It kind of collapses into a disk and then like a whirlpool, it spirals around before eventually getting sucked in. And that whirlpool, as it gets closer and closer to the um, black hole or neutron star or whatever, it gets really fast and the gas particles are rubbing up against each other a bunch and it heats up the gas. And if you remember from black body radiation, a really hot gas is going to emit a lot of really high energy light. So as you get closer and closer to the black hole, that gas is starting to emit light in the X-ray band of the, um, you know, the light spectrum. And we have telescopes, particularly the Chandra telescopes, uh, Chandra telescope that specializes in observing in the X-ray band. And so when we see these X-ray sources in the sky, um, we immediately think to ourselves, okay, this is probably an accretion disk around a black hole or a neutron star. On an exam, um, a couple of calculation questions that might be related to accretion disks is, uh, for example, if we ask, um, how much energy does gas gain by falling some certain distance towards a black hole? So that's basically related to converting between gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. Or another uh, really classic question is, if the gas at some certain point in the accretion, in the accretion disk um, has some certain temperature, calculate what wavelength of light is um, coming out of that gas. So that's called something called Wien's displacement law. That's spelled W-I-E-N. Um, uh, that'll help you calculate the wavelength of light that is most associated with that temperature. Um, another effect that helps us see black holes and neutron stars is gravitational lensing, which is the idea that um, photons that travel by a really massive object get bent by the gravitational field near that object. And that bending is kind of like um, the same kind of bending that light that passes through uh, like, a, like a glasses lens or something, it bends. Um, and so that causes distortion in the background of the, um, the lensing object. So in this animation here, so this is a simulation, not a real video, but um, 
you can imagine that there's some galaxy in the background and there's a black hole that's traveling um, in front of the galaxy and our telescope is tracking that black hole. And as it passes in front of the galaxy, it distorts the shape of the galaxy behind it. This other image here is actually a screenshot from the movie Interstellar. So this is the black hole that kind of plays a crucial role in that movie. And you can kind of see that there's this bright ring around it. Um, and that's not actually a bright ring that's around the black hole. That's the part of the accretion disk that's behind the black hole. And the light that's coming off that accretion disk is basically bending around the top and bottom of the black hole and then coming towards us, the observer. And it makes it look like there's a ring around the black hole, but it's actually just the light from behind the black hole that's being bent around it. So there's actually a DSO on the on this year's list that kind of deals with that. Um, and that's this, okay, I'm not gonna say it out loud, this entire name, um, but basically there's a, what's going on is that there's this um, galaxy cluster that has passed in front of a star and the entire mass of that galaxy cluster has bent the light of the star and kind of amplified it um, towards us. So we are getting more light than we otherwise would have because that lensing effect is kind of um, amplifying all of the amount of light that's coming towards us. Um, and actually, interestingly, it, it's um, the star, it's called Icarus, um, when it was observed, it was doubly lensed. So, the, so the, the cluster itself increased the light that we received by a factor of 600. But then another compact object, compact meaning probably either a black hole or a neutron star, um, passed in front of the cluster and then um, added another factor of four to that um, amplification. So in the end, the light that we actually received from Icarus is 2,400 times more than we would have if it hadn't been for the lensing effects. So some calculations that you might be expected to do with regards to lens lensing um, involve this equation. So this is basically the amount that the light has been deflected. And then G is Newton's gravitational constant. It's just a number. M is the mass of the object that's doing the deflecting. R is how close that photon passes um, by the object, and then sees the speed of light. Okay, um, the last effect I wanna talk about is gravitational waves. So you might've heard of this, I made the news a couple years ago. It's pretty, pretty hot stuff in astronomy right now. Um, and the idea is two orbiting objects, two really massive objects that are orbiting around each other really fast are going to create ripples in space and time itself. Okay, so what does that even mean? Um, the way you wanna think about it is that each of these ripples kind of corresponds to the stretching and shrinking of space itself. Um, it sounds wacky, but it's true. Um, Einstein predicted this, or Einstein came up with general relativity, which then someone else uh, figured out that that theory predicts exactly this phenomenon. And like all waves carry energy, right? Light waves carry energy, water waves carry energy. Um, and in the same way, the, these ripples in space-time carry energy away from the system. So where is that energy coming from? Um, and basically the answer is, it's coming from the rotational motion of these objects themselves. So as, it's, as these waves are carrying away energy, the objects start to rotate closer and closer and closer together. Um, until eventually they merge. And right before they merge, um, the gravitational waves coming out of this binary system of two rotating objects, um, those gravitational waves are pretty strong and we've been able to construct experimental devices that are able to um, detect those gravitational waves. And I wanna mention that all binary systems release gravitational waves, even the Earth and the Moon or the Earth and the Sun. But it's just that when the objects are not that massive or when the revolution period is kind of long, um, the gravitational waves that come out are just so weak that it's effectively negligible. It's only when you have massive objects like black holes and neutron stars very close to each other, revolving around each other very, very fast, 
um, that you get significant gravitational waves. And significant is a relative term because, um, well, I'll describe it in the next section. So this DSO is GW, so GW stands for gravitational wave, 15 for 2015, and then 1226 for December 26th. Um, so that was when this gravitational wave event was observed. And it was observed at LIGO. So LIGO is this, um, it's a pair of interferometers. So an interferometer, one interferometer is shown on the side here. So we've got two of them, one in Hanford, Washington, and the other in Livingston, Louisiana, both you know, in the United States. Um, and each interferometer basically has uh, two legs at right angles to each other. And each leg is a four kilometer long tunnel. Um, and you shoot a laser, split the laser between and split the laser into the two legs. There's a mirror on each end. The lasers bounce back. You combine the two lasers and then they hit a detector. And depending on the relative lengths between those two legs, uh, the light beams will either will interfere either constructively or destructively. So that's like the waves are either lining up with each other or not lining up with each other. And the detector is able to detect whether or not those um, light waves are lining up with each other or not, which depends on how long those two legs are. So when a gravitational wave passes through, like I said, it's a stretching and squishing, but it will only stretch and squish one of them relative to the other. And so the amount of interference and whether or not it's constructive or destructive um, oscillates as the gravitational wave passes through. And that's what these detectors are able to detect but the amount of oscillation is insane. It's basically smaller than the nucleus of an atom. That's the amount of stretching and squishing that these detectors have to be able to uh, distinguish, which it's kind of a miracle that they were able to pull this off at all. Um, and I guess that's why it's worth winning a Nobel Prize for. So this is the um, LIGO detection for this particular gravitational wave uh, observation. Um, and you can see that there's the Hanford signal and the Livingston signal. Um, and notice um, in the top image, the black is that, you know, the actual gravitational wave and the colored signal is what we actually measured. So the signal to noise ratio, SNR, which is kind of plotted in the next two graphs, is really, really high or really, really low. There's a lot of noise for the given amount of true signal, um, which I guess, makes sense considering that we have to detect a movement less than the size of the nucleus of an atom. So we can usually figure out a lot about the two objects that merge just by looking at this gravitational wave data. Um, for example, we can usually figure out um, what the two masses were of the two objects that merged together. Um, we can also kind of figure out roughly where in the sky um, these gravitational waves came from. So these are not like telescopes where you point a telescope at something and obviously what you're looking at is coming from that direction. Um, so figuring out where in the sky these waves comes from is actually a kind of a tricky task. Um, and it's actually why we have two of these interferometers, one in Washington, one in Louisiana. It's because um, you can kind of triangulate in the same way that your GPS triangulates using different satellites where you are on Earth, it's kind of like the reverse of that, where we have multiple um, gravitational wave observatories on Earth. There's one in Italy, for example. And they all coordinate with each other to figure out where in the sky approximately these gravitational waves come from. And sometimes, um, like for example, you've got two neutron stars that merge together um, and they merge and explode and then if you know where in the sky to look, then you can put your telescopes there and then you might be able to see remnants of the explosion. And in fact, that did happen um, at least once that I can think of. Um, and we learned a lot about uh, neutron star mergers and how they create heavy elements and a lot of cool things. Um, so yeah, so 
Accretion, lensing, and gravitational waves are three of the most common ways to observe and learn about these compact, dense objects, black holes and neutron stars. And black holes and neutron stars play a pretty crucial role all throughout astrophysics to learn about all sorts of um, things from the early universe, galaxies, um, all sorts of things.